book of Revelation today, Revelation chapter number 4, Revelation chapter number 4. I'm excited about coming into the book of Revelation. I don't know if it is uh, like this with you, but it's like the book of Revelation draws me to it. There are certain books that usually has a, a spiritual pull to it. And for me, one of those books is Revelation. And uh, I love how in Revelation chapter number 1, uh, the Lord will even say, Blessed is the man who reads the prophecy of this book. And so we understand that there are blessings that are found in understanding and knowing not only what is happening here and now, but also what is happening in the days ahead. And those are prophecies that the Lord will spell out for us in the Scripture. Now, I do want to remind you that the world has long been accustomed to terrible, terrible times. Uh, times that are not even to be compared with in our day. Well, we went through a global pandemic, but there have been times that this world has faced uh, since sin entered into it that can't even be uh, rightfully compared with, uh, with what we have experienced. Moments in history where hundreds of thousands of people have perished at the hands of a famine, at the hands of peril or of war, of natural disasters and diseases. You see, our world has known its fair share of tribulations. But out of all of the tribulations that this world has experienced, there is coming a great tribulation to this world that is going to be far greater than anything this world has ever experienced in the past. Uh, the period of time that the Lord will reveal to us after Revelation chapter number 4 is a, a, a period of tribulation that doesn't have to do with the product of man's abilities. Listen, there have been a lot of global hardships that was because a man got mean, a man got wicked, and tried to create war with uh, other places, and then the global war would ensue. We understand that man has brought catastrophes and tribulations to this world, but it's going to be much different than that kind of tribulation. And then also we understand that there have been these environmental catastrophes. Times when a volcano has erupted around the globe or earthquakes have happened or famines that have existed. But the time that God speaks about as the great tribulation is not the product of man. It's not the product of the environmental catastrophes. What this time is, is a time that God has reserved that he from heaven would pour out his wrath and judgment upon the wickedness of this world. So the great tribulation is not man-made, it's not uh, environmentally made. It is a wrath poured out from God from heaven. May I say it's going to be greater than any tribulation that man has ever seen before. So Jesus will come to John and he will tell him about this great prophecy, these visions of what is going to happen in the coming days. Uh, he wants us to be prepared and knowledgeable, understanding what is ahead of us. Now, this vision given to John to write down for us uh, talks about several different things. In verse number 19 of chapter 1, here's what Jesus will tell John to write. I want you to think, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And that is the whole conclusion of the book of Revelation. Chapter number one is the things which he has seen. It's the day of John. This is what's happening right now. And then chapter two and chapter three are the things which are. He will talk about the churches. And then from chapter four all the way to the end of the book, what John will record is the things which will happen thereafter. Now in chapter number two and chapter number three is talking about the church age. The church age. In revealing that, he will give us the names of these seven churches. These seven churches were uh, active churches in Asia during that time, but it speaks about a more broader subject than, than just those churches. It's speaking about something much more broad. But he will talk about the church, the church, the church. Think about this. In chapter 1, 2, and 3, you're going you're gonna to find the word church 18 times, 18 times in three chapters. Because when God views this world, he views it through the central focus of the church. 
God had established the church after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now when God works in this world, he works through the intricate workings of the local churches of God. He, that's how God works in this world today. However, when you come to chapter 4, something changes. In chapter 4, the, the Bible never mentions the word church. Chapter 5, church is not found. Chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and chapter 18. The word church is never mentioned. So how do we go from God looking upon this earth and seeing in verse chapter 1, 2, and 3, 18 times how he is looking at the world and he says the church 18 times, but chapter 4 happens and then chapter through 18 and God is still viewing the world, but the church is absent. The church has disappeared. The question I believe that remains is what has happened to the church? What has happened? It's not mentioned again until chapter number 19. You say, Pastor, what is it? What, it's what this great subject is, is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. And I believe this is crucial information to all of us. Because if you are saved, you are part of the church. What happens to you after chapter 3? And if you are not saved, you need to know this because you need to know what's going to happen after chapter number three. And so what we're going to be looking at is an all crucial, important subject of the rapture of the church. We're going to call it this, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I want us to look in chapter number four. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, after this, I looked. After what? Well, he's talking about these church ages. After the church ages, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And then immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne and he that sat was on to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. What you're going to find here is this thing called the rapture from chapter four, verse number one. And I want us to understand what is the concept of the rapture and why is it crucial for us to understand. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on the service today as we dwell upon the Word of God this morning. Let's pray. Lord, God, it is great to be in your house today. Lord, I am so thankful to be here gathered with friends and family in Christ. God, brothers and sisters all coming together for a common cause, and that is to simply preach the Word of God. Lord, it is a humbling experience to be behind this desk today. God, to be able to preach the Word of God in an unadulterated form not tampered with or tempered by it, simply coming to know what does thus saith the Lord in the Scriptures. So Lord, I pray that you would empower your servant today. God, help me to say every word that would be pleasing unto you. God, I pray that you would hinder me from saying anything that would not be pleasing unto you. God, I pray that you would speak to every heart and help us to learn today. Help us to be taught from the Holy Scriptures. Lord, that we might be benefited from our life and that we might live according to what we find in your word today, for it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Uh, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. There was a little girl who had came to church one Sunday morning and heard the preacher preaching about the rapture of the church. And she got to be uh, very convicted about this and wondering concerning what God was going to do and when he was going to come. At the end of church, she got in the car with her mom and as they were walking off and driving away, she said to her mom, uh, do you believe, mom, that uh, the Lord's coming back? And her mom says, oh, baby, I, I believe the Lord's coming back with all of my heart. And she said, the pastor said, mom, that uh, the Lord could come back this year. Do you believe he could come back this year? And she, her mom said, yeah, I believe that he could come back this year. She got wide eyed and she says, Mom, do you think he could come back this week? Her mom says, yes. Do you believe that he could come back today? She says, yes. She says, Mom, do you believe he could come back in a few minutes? And she says, well, yes, baby, I believe that. She says, Mom, will you please comb my hair? <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> oh, throughout the Gospels, the Lord is constantly telling His disciples, reminding them to watch and wait for the return of Christ. He is saying throughout the Gospels to wait for His return, always watching uh, to see when Christ would come back. And then in the epistles, men like Peter and Paul and others would constantly be talking about how we need to be ready for the Lord's coming. Paul will write to that preacher, Titus, in chapter number 2, in verse 13 of Titus. He will say, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that he's always talking about how we need to be watching for the return of the Lord because it is the blessed hope of those who believe. Now as a church, Bethel, we preach and we teach that they are, we are certain about the Lord's return. We believe with all of our heart that Christ is coming and He is coming again in the air. And His job in that time of coming in the air where He will not step down on this earth physically is He's going to step out on that eastern sky as the Bible declares. He's going to have this trumpet blow and then He's going to shout with a shout that says, Come up hither and then we which are alive will be caught up together with those who have died on before and resurrected from the grave. That is the great calling away. That is what we refer to as the rapture of the church. When God calls His bride home to be with Him uh, in this time of rapture. The Bible will say this in 1 Thessalonians 4 in verse 16 and 17. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We believe solidly that, the whole, that, that God Himself, Jesus Christ, is going to come and bring His children home, bring home the bride. Yet, when does this time take place? Historically, there have been many men that have taught three different positions on when the rapture of the church takes place. Historically, there have been many that have said that it is a pre-tribulation rapture, which simply means that uh, the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation comes. Before God begins to open the seals of His wrath and pour out the vials of His judgment upon the earth, that there is going to be this great taking away, which is the rapture, and it happens before the tribulation. Then others say it's a mid-tribulation rapture of the church, which they believe that uh, it, three and a half years will happen of tribulation uh, and then the rapture will take place and then there's three and a half more years of tribulation. That, uh, that God's people will endure to some degree the wrath and judgment of God that He's pouring upon the wickedness of this world. That's what mid-tribs believe. And then there are also these that call themselves post-tribulation which simply means that at the end of the tribulation time, when Christ comes back on that white horse, that there's going to be uh, this calling away, we'll meet Him in the air and immediately go into the battle of Armageddon. Those are the three different views of tribulation. However, biblically, overwhelmingly supports the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That's what the Bible overwhelmingly supports. And that simply means that God is going to remove His bride. He's going to remove them before God pours out His wrath upon this world called the Great and Terrible Tribulation. Now this reveals to us something very, very important. A pre-tribulation belief in what the Scriptures portray is extremely important to this fact. That means that there is nothing prophetically hindering the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe what the Scriptures show, which is a pre-tribulation rapture, then you believe that there's the only thing that's going to happen next prophetically is the trumpet of God is going to sound, He's going to step out on a cloud, and the very next thing that could happen is God's people would be called home to be with Him. Now, all of us that are saved, this is important because we understand what's going to happen next. Then also those who are unbelievers, we need to know what this means because you need to be prepared for what happens next. Because the scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians in chapter number 2, verse number 10, 11, and 12, that the person who has heard 
a clear presentation of the gospel. That Jesus loved them, lived a sinless life, came to this earth, uh, died a sacrificial death. He, he was uh, crucified for our sins, uh, sh shed his blood for our sins, uh, resurrected the third day. If you have heard a clear presentation of the gospel and have rejected that, have not turned to faith in Jesus, then the Bible tells us there in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 10, 11, and 12, that that person who has had an opportunity to be saved and has rejected Jesus will be given a delusion to believe a lie. They then will take the mark of the beast upon their head or upon their wrist and they will follow the Antichrist in this great battle of Armageddon against the Lord Jesus Christ and they will die in that battle and forever be damned to hell. That's what the Bible teaches about someone who has heard the clear presentation of the gospel and have rejected it in the ages of the church. That's what the Bible will simply declare there in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, 11, and 12. You say, Pastor, why are you preaching this this morning? Well, I preach this this morning because of two things. Number two, with all of my heart, the Holy Spirit of God has led me to this chapter to expound upon these pages. Number two, I preach this because I'm convinced with all of my being that that day that we're speaking about right here, the trumpet sound, the dead in Christ rise, and we which are alive and remain are cut up together to meet them in the air. I'm convinced with every ounce of my 247 pounds <laughs> that this day is pending. Yeah. I believe we're on the cuff of eternity. I believe it could happen any second. There's nothing prophetically speaking that's in the way of the rapture of the church. How many's ever had something that was pending? Anybody ever had something that was pending? How many's ever wrote a, a person a 20 or $30 check for their birthday, put in the card, signed it, gave it to them? On the way home, you look in your bank account and find there's only one dollar left in your bank account. How many's ever done that, right? I'm going to tell you, all of us that's broken and uh, young, we've been there before, right? And then you think, oh man, what am I going to do? I overdrafted twice last month. I can't do it again this month. And so you take your wallet in that secret place. I know you've got a secret place. <laughs> and you get that hundred dollar bill out. And you take it as fast as you can up to the bank before it closes and says, hey, can you put this in my account? They say, sure. You said, when will it go th through? <laughs> and they say, well, we're not really for sure. We know it's there. I mean, it's, it's going to go in there. It's going to happen, but we don't know. You go on your checking account and it says, at the very end, it says transaction there. But at the end, it says Pending. We don't know when it's going to go through. Just know it's going to be soon. May I say the rapture of the church is the pending pinnacle of this age. And so we need to understand what does the Bible teach us concerning the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Although we don't know when this is going to happen, we do know that it's imminent. Why, pastor? Pastor? Three reasons, biblically. I want you to see them in the scriptures today from your Bible. Number one, uh, because revelation declares it. We believe this because the revelation of Jesus Christ declares this truth. In the book of Revelation, uh, Christ gives us a prophetic timeline. It is a progressive revelation that goes from the day of John in chapter number one all the way to the time in Revelation chapter number 22 when God makes a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and a new throne and all of those things forever and ever for eternity and eternity. So that's what's happening is there is this progressive revelation from chapter number one all the way to chapter number 22. And it's after one after another, one after another, one after another, the things that are progressively being revealed as a timeline. Now, we understand that when John gets done talking about that specific day in chapter number one where Jesus reveals himself to him and tells him to write this prophecy in a book, 
After that very day, what you're going to find is chapter number two and chapter number three begins to deal with the churches or what we could consider the church ages. And we understand that these were seven actual churches of Asia in that day, but the much broader picture is that they represent the ages or the completion of the church age. Let me, let me tell you this. When God uses the word seven, He has got more on His mind and in His heart and in His message than just a number. The number seven always is in reference to this is complete. And Revelation is a book of sevens. There are seven spirits. There are seven golden uh, lampstands. There are seven stars. There are seven seals. And when he gets done opening the seventh seal, the book is open. Why? Because the seals have been completed. There are seven trumpets. When the seventh trumpet blows, that has been fulfilled and on to the next thing. There are seven then, uh, there are seven vials that are being poured out. When those seven vials are being poured out, after the seventh one is done, then that area is completed. And when we come back to knowing that the church is here in chapter two and chapter number three, when he explains the last church, he will talk about the church age of Laodicea. And if you will read verses 14 through 19 of chapter number 3, you're going to see a church very familiar and uncannily uh, resembling the church age of our day. Laodicea is a church that is rich and increased with goods. They have no need of anything. It is a church that is lukewarm. It is a church where there are men pleasers with itching ears only preaching what the crowd wants to hear. It is a church that is in need of great repentance. And I want to understand this morning that it is amazing to me how many churches are meeting at this very time, but when they meet, they never open the Word of God. That is amazing to me. It is sad to me that many churches will uh, go to a place of assembly. They'll sing some good songs that are spiritually uplifting, but then they'll open up the Word of God, read one verse, and never go back to it. That should alarm everyone in those crowds. I don't need what you want, and you don't need what I want to give you. You need the Word of God. I need the Word of God. So that church age of Laodicea, is there as this lukewarm church having itching ears in need of repentance. And it is after that age, may I say, after this age, when John hears a trumpet blow. Isn't that something? And not only does he hear a trumpet blow, but he hears a voice saying, come up hither. And in a twinkling of an eye, he's raised from this earth and he finds a new place called heaven. I want you to read here with me verse number 20 of the previous chapter. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup unto him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit, on, uh, sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If you have a spiritual ear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church age. And at the end of that chapter, notice how chapter 4 begins. After this... I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, in the twinkling of an eye, in other places it's found. I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set upon the throne. It is, it is so uh, Interesting how much Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 through 3 is identical to 1 Thessalonians chapter numbers 4 in verse 16, 17, uh, verses 16 and 17. They're almost similar. They're almost just parallel right beside each other. And it was Paul giving what God had showed him. And now it's John giving what Jesus has now showed him. We find that is this after the church age, there is this rapture of the church. And that's what's happening. Now, after the rapture of the church, at the beginning of chapter number four, 
Chapter number four and chapter number five will give us a glimpse of what's happening at that time around the throne. And then chapter number six will begin with the opening up of the seals of the book. And the seals of the book is God opening up His wrath upon the earth. And what you're going to notice is the church, when God is dealing with the earth through chapter four all the way through chapter number 18, that the church is not mentioned. You want to know why? Because the church is with Him in heaven. And that's what the Scriptures reveal to us through this revelation that declares it. Here's what the Bible says about the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians was talking about uh, how these Thessalonian believers had thought that the day of the Lord or the tribulation had already taken place. And they were worried that they either missed it or they were living through the tribulation. And here's what Paul will tell that church of Thessalonica. He said, listen, don't worry. Because the truth of the matter is, God has not appointed you to His wrath. As a child of God, you're not appointed to wrath. You're appointed to salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not appointed to go through the wrath. I love... That God as a good, good Father chastens us. How many is thankful for the chastening hand of God? How many's ever gotten whooping and taken to the, the woodshed by Jesus? Anybody ever been there, right? You say something, you do something, you go off on somebody, and the Holy Spirit of God says, Nuh-uh-uh, big boy. That's the chastening of the hand of God. But as a good, good Father, listen to this, please. God has not appointed you as His child to be in His wrath. Do you remember what God will tell parents? He will say, don't chasten them in your anger. Don't chasten them in your madness, in your wrath. And listen, if God commands the parents of this world not to chasten their children in His wrath, do you think He's going to give you the wrath of God? Why, no. He's a good father and He's never going to tell you to do something that He would do the opposite of. So we understand here is the revelation declares a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Number two, I want you to notice, because restraint determines it. Restraint determines the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and I want you to hold your spot here in Revelations. We're going to be coming back. But turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and I want us to... Read something here in just a moment. You say, Pastor, as I'm turning, do you know who the Antichrist is? Well, if you were to ask me, I would have said it was Hitler. That's who I would have thought it would have been. I mean, you look at all that he did, I would have thought that he would have been the Antichrist. I want you to understand the truth about God and about the devil. Our God is a God that's called, a characteristic of him is called omnipresent. You know what that means? He's here, there, and everywhere all at the same time. When I leave here, guess what? God goes with me. But when you leave here, guess what? God goes with you if you're saved. Uh, But He's everywhere at all times. That's omnipresent. Also, God is all-powerful. There is nothing, the Bible says, that is too hard for God. But another characteristic of the Lord Jesus and of God is that He is omniscient. Now, omniscient means that he knows everything. There is nothing outside of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, I want you to think about the day of the Lord's return. Okay, think about it. How many remembers a book called 88 Reasons God's Coming Back in 1988? Anybody remember that book? I think I remember Pastor Parker preaching about it. And then the Lord didn't come back in 1988. So guess what? The next year? 89 reasons the Lord's coming back in 89. It happened again. He, the same author in 1993. 93 reasons the Lord's coming back. But you know what the Bible says about the day of the Lord's return? No man knoweth the day or the hour. It's, it's revealed only to God Himself, God the Father. He said not even the angels... No, Jesus would say, I don't even know. It's reserved to only God. He's the only one. God the Father only knows. So guess what that means? 
The devil doesn't even know. Because there is not a characteristic of the devil. The devil is not omniscient. The devil doesn't know everything. And so many people have shown to believe that every generation, the devil will rise up to wickedness and power somebody who would take over being the Antichrist. Does that make sense? He doesn't know when Jesus is coming back. So he always in every generation has his man that he is elevating in this wickedness, elevating in this power to become that Antichrist if the Lord comes back in that generation. That's what the Bible is uh, declaring to us that the Antichrist is on spot and ready to go. But he's not been revealed yet. Say, Pastor, do you know who he is? I got about three, three guesses. <laughs> How many has about three names you could think? I think it could be them. Anybody like that, right? I won't tell you. However, the Bible says that he will not be revealed. You say, Pastor, when will he re be revealed? Well, he can't be revealed until that which is restraining him is removed. That's this point. There is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Why? Because restraint determines it. I want you to turn, look in here at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 7 and verse number 8. The Bible says, For the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of wickedness, doth already work. Do you notice what he's saying here? The Antichrist is already at work. Uh, only he who now letteth will let. Another good way of saying this is only he who now hindereth will hinder. Only he who now restraineth will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the light brightness of his coming. You say, Pastor... Somebody's restraining the devil from coming and the Antichrist from being revealed? Absolutely. You say, who is it? Marion Hammond. <laughs> well, not really, but kind of. I used to work in a place uh, which was like a halfway house to prison for teenage boys. So if a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 18-year-old did something that would normally take them to incarceration and a judge said I don't want him to go to jail I want him to go to this place I used to work in one of those places and if there was a boy there that um, got out of control his temper flared he got mad at what he was supposed to do or what he was supposed to eat or where he was supposed to wear his britches and he got mad and was about to hit somebody we had uh, the responsibility of restraining him. Do you know what the laws of restraintment is? Here it is. There's only one. You better be bigger and badder than he. That's the only law. That's not good English, but that sure is good living right there. You better be bigger and badder than he. That's the only law of restraint. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Come on up here, Scott. Scott's a big old boy. And if Scott wanted to get to this side of the building, I would get out of his way. <laughs> you are, yeah, I'm not mad. I'm not going to try to restrain Scott. He's bigger than me. Thank you, Scott. But Joseph, come on up here, Joseph. Joseph's more my type. <laughs> Joseph, come on up here, and I want you to try to get there over there to that side. Of the, hey, come here. <laughs> Don't kill me, illustration. Okay, try. Now, I'm being honest with you. Try. Get, get there. Get there. Okay, hold on a second. There we go. So the law of restraint, listen to this. The law of restraint is you've got to be bigger and better than the person you're restraining. Now, here's the truth. Are you ready for it? Who can restrain the devil? You say, Pastor, maybe some angel can. Did you realize in Jude chapter number 1 and verse number 9, God was sent the archangel Michael to restrain him and he was having a problem and he had to rebuke him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Not even the angel could even, re could even restrain him. Amen. You want to know who can restrain the devil? Amen. There's only one person. Are you ready? His name is God Almighty. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I said earlier, there was a restrainer in this room that won't allow the Antichrist to be revealed and Satan to come in power. You want to know who that was? I said Marion Hammond, and that's half true. You want to know why? Here you go. Marion, have you been saved by the grace of God? Yes, I have. By faith you've trusted Him to be your personal Savior. The Holy Ghost lives inside of Him. Amen. And guess what? This Antichrist cannot be revealed in this life. Why? Because the Holy Ghost of God's here. Amen. And He's restraining Him from coming. Amen. Now that tells us something there in 2 Thessalonians. Okay, are you ready? When the Holy Ghost is removed... When those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are the temple of Almighty God, and God lives in them, when they are taken out, guess what? The Holy Ghost is taken out, and the restraint is gone. That teaches us that not only is the revelation that declares it, but the restraint determines it. We understand and know the concept that God is in us and working for us. And then we understand that when we are removed in Revelation chapter number 4, would you turn there with me once again? Chapter number 4 and chapter number 5 speak about what at that very moment is happening in heaven. And then chapter number 6 begins practically at the same time. Look at verse number 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard a noise thunder, one of the beasts uh, saying, Come and see. And at that very moment, guess what happens? The four horsemen. How many have ever heard of the four horsemen? I'm not talking about Ric Flair, okay? (laughs) Woo! I'm not talking about Ric Flair. I'm talking about the four horsemen. He says at that very moment, the first seal is opened and the four horsemen are revealed. Guess who the very first horsemen? horseman is. Now let me help you. He comes out on a white horse. Guess who only is reserved to a white horse? That is the save, the redeem, and the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a rider upon this white horse that comes in the image of Christ who is the Antichrist. The first horseman is the Antichrist. And he comes immediately when that seal is opened after the church is raptured home to heaven. So we find that the restraint uh, declares it. Number three, I want you to notice representatives describe it. Did you know that God has always been revealing eternal truths since the very beginning of time? He's always been revealing himself. Do you remember when Jesus was being questioned by the Pharisees and Sadducees about giving them a sign that he was there, that he was the Messiah? They said, we we want a sign from you to show us that you are from God. Jesus says, you're seeking a sign, but I'm not going to give you a sign except for one. Do you remember what it was? He said, except for the sign of Jonah, the prophet. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the only sign Jesus said, I want to give the the Pharisees and Sadducees there. He says, when I die, I'll be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and then I'll be resurrected. That shows us before Jesus ever was on the scene, God had revealed the, that Jesus was going to be in the earth for three days and three nights and he was revealing to us through that through this man named Jonah. But also God reveals to us in the book of Genesis several times the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. You say, Pastor, where? Well, the book of Luke, chapter number seven, reveals several representatives, several different people who describe that by their life and by the grace that they found in Jesus. Now I want to read of one of those. Luke chapter number 17, verse 28, 29, and 30 says this. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot. Oh man, now we're going somewhere, aren't we? You may remember Lot. 
He pitched his tent close to Sodom, found himself living in Sodom and Gomorrah. We understand that Jesus and two of the angels come to Abraham. Abraham begins to plead and beg, God, will you not destroy that for these righteous people's sake? And we go from 40 to 30 all the way down. You remember that interchange between Abraham and, and God. And then those angels go to that place, Sodom and Gomorrah, and their desire is to get Lot, the righteous, out of the city. Now here's what the Bible says. Here's what Jesus says, Luke 17, 28, 29, 30. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now you may remember that those two angels went into that place and you saw the wickedness of Sodom and the sin of Gomorrah. You saw all of those beating on the doors to try to get those angels out that those men might be able to lay with them. We see the wickedness. We see the sinful transaction. But then those, those angels will tell Lot, you've got to get out of here. You've got to go. We've got to be removed from this place. Finally, they get him and his wife who will eventually turn to a pillar of salt because her heart was in Sodom. And then Lot and his two daughters are going to be taken out of the city. And guess what Lot does? Like any good Baptist, he argues with the angel. And he says, I don't want to go to the mountains. You remember that? I don't want to go to where you're taking me. I want to go to Zoar. And the angel says something very interesting. I, I want to read it to you. Genesis chapter number 19. This was revealed to us before we ever knew anything about tribulation. Genesis chapter 19 verse 22. Here's what the angel says a lot. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. You know what the angel just revealed? That he cannot bring down fire and brimstone of wrath and judgment of God until the righteous ones were removed from the city itself. He says, I can't do anything until you get out of here. What does that show us? Jesus says, so as it is in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In Luke 17, Christ reveals other accounts of other lives that are representatives of this pre-tribulation truth of the rapture of the church. And that teaches us the important lesson that Jesus comes to remove his bride, his church, before there is ever a tribulation time. Now that is crucially important. And here's the reason why. Because that sets up for us the timeline that we can expect. Listen, there are a lot of people looking for the Antichrist. There's a lot of people looking for the tribulation time. There's a lot of people looking for nuclear war that's going to destroy the earth. They're, they are all uh, being captivated by something they're looking for, but Jesus says, listen, these things ain't going to happen. Why? Because the next thing on the prophetic timeline is you're going to hear a trumpet blow. And so many people are so captivated by nuclear war that they've quit listening for the trumpet blow. And Jesus says it's all important because you have got to be prepared. You say, Pastor, I'm saved. I've received Christ as my personal Savior. What does this all mean for me? It means that you don't have to worry about the days ahead. Amen and amen. I don't have to worry about the wrath of God. I'm not going to be part of it. I'm looking what the Bible says in Titus for that blessed hope, the glorious God of heaven going to step out on the clouds and take me home. Save me from the wrath and judgment of God being poured out upon this earth. I want to tell you, that makes me happy. <laughs> you say, Pastor, I'm lost. What does this mean to me? Eternally, it means everything. It means everything. If you have not, if you have not received Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, if you... By, not by, uh, if you haven't received him uh, by grace through faith, turn from sin to the Savior. If you've never been saved, 
You've already heard a clear presentation of the gospel. That means if the trumpet sounded at this very moment, all of those people that are saved in this building would be removed from the, in the rapture. You would look around here and you would say, Shazam. And I don't care what the Left Behind series book says because the Bible is better than those books. The Left Behind series says, well, we better work ourselves into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you will be given a delusion to believe a lie because you already rejected your chance to heaven. So what that means is when everyone, if that rapture happened now, us that are saved would go on, you look around and say, Shazam! There's been an alien invasion. Isn't it interesting that the world at this very time is releasing all these documentations about, about intergalactic, I don't even know what other words are, <laughs> intercontinental happenings in the eye that they can't explain. You know, what's, you know what's being set up? Here it is. Are you ready? The rapture of the church. Because those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will believe the lie. They'll see a white horse coming out of heaven, which is the Antichrist. They'll believe everything he says. They'll gladly line up and take his mark. They'll get their uh, swords together and their guns and their ammunition. They'll point them up to the sky because you know what he's saying? That alien encounter that just happened, he's coming back in seven years. And we've got to get our ammunitions pointed to the sky because he's about to come with all those people again. And they'll believe that they're doing a good thing, fighting off an alien invasion. And yet they found themselves fighting against Jesus in the battle of Armageddon. And friend, it don't go good for them. Amen. It's all important. Mm -hmm. It's crucially needful for you to know and understand that the rapture of the church happens next. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's all stand together. <laughs> Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let's all stand together. Let me ask you a question. How many thankful you don't have to go through the wrath of God? <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to put both hands up. If you're here today and you know with all of your heart, there's not a doubt in your mind that you've, by faith, received the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, you have no worries or concerns about the future because all your hope is found in Jesus and Him alone. If you have that confidence in your heart today and you have that calm assurance, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to go through that mess. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. There's people in this room today that with the honesty of their heart could not raise their hand in testimony to that. And may I say... If today the Lord came back, you would be given a delusion to believe a lie, find yourself fighting against God. And God is calling you today. I can tell you want to know why? Because I can sense some of your all's hearts beating about 120 miles per hour right now. See, God, I, I, can't, I can't even control what's going on in my body right now. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit of God preparing you and pleading with you and urging you to get things right for Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Christ to be your personal Savior, you say, Pastor, I don't have any idea what would happen to me if the rapture happened right now. I don't know what, I, what would happen. Pastor, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. I won't come back and embarrass you. I won't call out your name. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you specifically, but not aloud. Say, Pastor, I ask that you pray for me because I just don't know. If that's you, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around but me and the Holy Ghost. 